All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this roundtable on uh, Crown Tournament um, and everything that's involved in, in running it and uh, hosting it and contemplating it and fighting in it and all sorts of things. So um, Kilmany has already done introductions, but let's again uh, introduce uh, His Majesty Kuin, Her Majesty Edelheit, uh, Their Excellencies, um, Eckhart and Jane. And we also have um, Sir Jocelyn, our Knight Mar our Earl Marshal. We have Lady Sarah, our Kingdom Minister of the Lists. And if Simone joins us, we will have our wonderful um, Kingdom Seneschal. But if not, um, we will just proceed without. So the first thing I wanted to ask in order to just sort of get us started is um, what's everyone's favorite part about Crown Tournament? Let's start with Edelheit. You're going to come to me first, weren't you? I absolutely, Your Majesty. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I think my favorite uh, part about Crown Tournament is really how everybody sort of dedicates themselves to that day. And I know that that's um, probably something that people aren't used to hearing about the SEA because everything is, uh, you know, it's, it's everything to everybody often in events. But that day, it's about the fighting and it's about the future leadership. And um, it's just a really neat atmosphere, uh, you know, to to experience and I like the pageantry that goes along with it. I think people put a lot of effort into that and it's a really beautiful day. Wonderful. I like that. His Majesty Kuhn. My favorite part about Crown Tourney, and I'm going with what occurred when to me when you asked the question. So that's got to be it, is placing the coronet on the winner's brow and then giving them the opportunity to uh, place the cornet on their inspiration, um, the person who uh, inspired them uh, to victory that day. That's just tops, that's it. Good answer. Jocelyn, what's your favorite part of Crown Tournament? Either as a participant, marshal, or uh, uh, just supporter? You know, I how supportive people are of each other, especially as things get closer to the finals. Um, you know, people really bend over backwards to help the consorts not stress if it's the first or second or third time they've been forced to watch somebody fight in the finals, and that because that's really really hard. Um, the the help that people give for everything from the list tree to you know helping people set up pavilions i mean it's it's sort of atlantia on at its at its best and most supportive um and it's cool to see i agree i agree it is really wonderful to, to witness lady sarah what's your favorite part about crown tournament um i think the herald and me loves the pageantry of it but the chivalry and how much of the dream it shows that day is really incredible. Yes, the, the banners and the her heraldic display is definitely wonderful to see, but the, uh, the behavior is always inspiring. Your Excellencies, Eckhart and Jane. Do you have a favorite part of Crown Tournament? Oh, I've always loved the pageantry. I've always loved the heraldry that everyone has. Um, it's always fun to see what they come up with for the fighter and consort. Um, that's That's been a lot of fun for me to be able to watch and listen to. I think my favorite part of Crown Tournament is, especially uh, coming up, is just being able to come and pit myself against those people who, you know, decide that I'm going to enter crown tournament and, you know, before the fighting starts to, you know, talk to them and their lady. And, you know, um, it's always been my uh, way to uh, offer my support to them if they should win the day. And, you know, most times it's returned in kind 
And I just love that aspect of crown tournament that for the most part, I, if you talk to anybody on the list field, they're ready to support whoever wins. And I love that about crown tournament. Yes, because ultimately we all have the same goal in the end is having a new prince and princess and supporting them going forward. So wonderful. Thank you all. Do we have a Simone yet? She might not. She's yeah. been moving. She's been dealing with a lot. That's understandable. Okay, so let's go on to the next question is what preparations do each of your positions have to do ahead of each crown tournament? So your majesties come in at height. What preparations do you have to do as the crown hosting the tournament to determine your heirs? I, I think the very first thing that we have to do is communicate with each other on what our expectations are for the tournament that day in general, how we want it ran, what we want it to look like. And that includes the individuals that participate in it as well. And then we have to decide from there um, you know, essentially what we're looking for in our heirs, I think. Your Majesty, what else do you have? So it's, it, the answer is different depending on whether it's two friends reigning together like me and Ash or a couple who are in a romantic relationship reigning together because it's, it's much easier, obviously, to have conversations uh, with somebody you come home to every night um, it takes real coordination to do what Ash and I are doing. And so early on, we talked about um, how early can we push out the format so that people can prepare and know what to expect. What's the site going to look like? Uh, Jeffrey uh, was talking to me about the site. Uh, Baron Jeffrey was talking to me about the site early on. Uh, Adelric was talking to me about the site early on and what we could expect, what our facilities would be, how big our list fields would be, because that also shapes the format. If I tend to occasionally try and do things that are a little different. And so people talk a lot about off weapons and weapon steps. So I was trying to figure out a way to give more people a chance to participate and not Put on their armor and put on a big show and <clears throat> a lot of those people will get two fights and out so combining the idea of displaying weapons depth and giving people a chance to have more fights uh, and we didn't have some of the site restrictions that we had at november crown so we have a little more room at the fairgrounds so what we were thinking about was um, if we do four round robin lists to start the show, then depending on which list you enter, you may have up to nine fights. So you can get plenty of fighting. And since most people are most familiar with Sword and Shield, most comfortable with Sword and Shield, that will probably end up being the biggest of the four preliminary lists. But that means that anybody who comes out on their first, you know, with their weapons form, they're the most familiar with, they've been fighting the longest, they can get up to like say 10 of our 27 entrants that are 28 entrants that we have this time, say 10 of them want to be in sword and shield. Well, you're going to get a full, you're going to get nine fights if that's how that winds up. And I don't know that it will. And if you're going to be in great sword, there may be six people vying for four spots in the 16. Um, so that's the kind of thing we thought about, but then we wanted to try and get that format out as much ahead of time as we could and then uh, make sure that we published that, got letters. I tried to write a lot of invitations to people um, to generate excitement. And, uh, and, and, and Ash and I uh, talked it up quite a bit because one of the things that people don't know about being crowned necessarily is um, we are responsible for trying to get people to events. And that's why we pick the sites that we pick uh, we only have one event left where we really get to help in site selection, and that's coronation. And that's why coming out of the pandemic, we picked a site where we could get, you know, the 480 some people that we had uh, to try and build excitement. So that's kind of a inside baseball look at it, but but that's what went into our thinking. That's a lot to consider. 
And we know that um, the Seneschal is key in working with the Crown as far as um, accepting the letters of intent um, and making sure that everybody's membership numbers are up to date and their membership length is for uh, long enough for a proposed reign and things like that. Um, but Sarah, what preparations then go to you once they're the crown and their and the seneschal send you a list or what kind well, of think, preparations do you as the king of MOL running the tournament have to consider well before that even happens before letters of intent go out i usually am trying to communicate with their majesties about what kind of format they want so i can figure out what i need to staff because that's the biggest thing um with I think your last crown tournament, we had four fighting fields at the same time. So there's 13 MOLs working it. This time we don't need as many MOLs because of the way we're running the tournament. So it's a little bit easier for staffing. But that's the first thing is figuring out what format is with the double elimination at the end. Figure out the staffing. And then from there, it's um, pretty much checking authorizations. And if there's anything else that needs to be addressed handling it, but not much. Okay. And Jocelyn, what do you have to do in order to prepare for crown tournament as the Earl Marshal? So what, what we, we've tried to do in recent history um, is have the Kingdom Earl Marshal, who is the right of appeal for somebody following, say, a disagreement in crown, to not be the marshal in charge of crown and to have somebody else responsible for running the fields so that we've got the marshals who are actively watching the fighting. Then we've got the marshal who's responsible for supervising all those marshals who would be the next step up on an appeal process. And then you've got the, the Kingdom Earl Marshal who is hopefully just kind of hanging out and you know eating bonbons all day and just sort of there to kind of keep an eye on things overall. So that my job as KEM in the prep is to make sure we have a really good experienced senior marshal who can run the field. Um, oftentimes it's a Duke or in the case of this crown, a former society Earl Marshal and a former kingdom Earl Marshal, Master Alan Gravesend. And also to make sure that we have really high quality marshals who can marshal the lists with a minimum of two marshals per list. Fascinating. Um, your Excellencies, as participants, former participants, uh, what did you have to consider as far as uh, preparation for crown tournament when you were planning on entering a crown? Uh, so for my part um, in the crowns before I won, my participation was, my prep was just to go and fight a whole lot and, and just show up on the day and have a great day with my lady. Um, and the crown that I won, the prep was far different. Um, not only did I train, but I uh, had a network of uh, fellow knights who uh, helped me scour the internet for videos on all of uh, Duke Havort's fights and Count Veneman's fights uh, so that I could see the way that they fought and then I could take that to practice and have people fight that way so that I would understand the range that, that, that he might have um, and the different blocks that I might have to do. And it served me re obviously really well. Um, but yeah, but there was a lot of video watching, a lot of video watching and a lot of specific um, detailed um, training at, at practice. Countess Jane, what do you normally do in the maybe before times? <laughs> so like a mad woman. So yeah, so like a mad woman, because um, you always want to have something new and pretty. Um, I think I I've always been quiet, but I sit back and observe, and I observe a lot, and for me. I would always observe the current majesty and the other people that might have been roses that have done it before. Um, 
because it, it's really a learning experience to be able to see what you should do and how you should act and what you should prepare for. And although he's, he came close, came close a couple times before, I think I was much more ready and prepared this last time um, and had to really wrap my head around the fact that, all right, this could definitely happen. So I need to prepare myself. Um, I have very high anxiety. So um, you don't see that a lot when we're around other people um, because it's like, okay, you have a job to do now and you need to do it. So you need to do what it is that you know you should be doing. Um, and also supporting your fighter. Um, it's very important on the day of that, even though it is a day for you, the consort, it is very much a day for your fighter and you need to be there on the side of the field, cheering them on, making sure they have a drink ready for them, taking care of whatever needs they may have behind the scenes to make sure that they're having a good day as well, because it's a partnership. It's a partnership. And um, yeah, it definitely should be a partnership. If it's not, I guess you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and, and, and Jen, if I may, I, yes. so much of that involves the, the concert knowing when to give the fighter space, when to not give the fighter space. Yeah. And it, it, you know, the, it, it's, the couples that stay together over a hard rain are typically the couples who are really supportive of one another during the the day of crown and during the time before crown it's it's definitely a a team effort the whole endeavor yeah i just want to follow up that I, i'm laughing because Obviously, I've reigned with Christoph before, and that, that's my husband. And I know all of his ins and outs and what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do with him on the day of Crown. And then when Kuhn and I fought for each other, there were moments at Crown Tournament I was like, oh, my God, what am I supposed to do with Kuhn? I can't, I can't go up and, like, cuddle him. You know, that's not our thing. Like, do I bring him a drink right now? Do I leave him alone? What do I do? And those were things that I don't think we actually discussed beforehand and, you know, wouldn't want to step on Signe's toes to take care of him because that's, that's his, you know, their, their thing together. Right. So it was, it was a strange day for me. I remember driving home with Chris and I was like, well, that was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, since Signe was a fighter herself, you know, she might not have seen, been able to see everything that you were seeing as the consort who was focused on his fights versus Christoph's fights. Um, so yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting thing to think about. So let's go a bit back to the beginning. Why do the crowns ask for the letters of intent from a participant so far in advance? Um, and what do you look for in a good letter of intent? Like what's the bare minimum and what do you love to see? I believe you're muted, your majesty. Sorry. So the bare minimum is you've got to have a uh, name, SCA name, uh, membership number, enough information so that the seneschal can determine that you meet the requirements of kingdom law and or corpora to enter crown tournament. And in the old days, that used to be so difficult because it was all done by mail. And uh, Lucan had a crown taken away from him uh, because his membership turned out to have expired and they didn't get his renewal at corporate. And in the East Kingdom, he ended up having to give up a crown win because of that. And uh, these days, it's amazing to me that we can just go online and re-up our membership, make sure we don't have any lapses because you have to be a member for a certain period of time and you have to not have had a lapse uh, in there. And so you never have to have your membership lapse now. You can re-up for, I re-up for three years at a time. Um, so that's, that's sort of the bare bones uh, mechanics of it. And then 
Um, we've had some amazing letters of intent. I've seen some amazing letters of intent. Uh, um, the, my last reign, um, um, Alaren and Linnea sent this amazing package that uh, included a, it was poetic and it was a scroll and it, it, it had, um, it had pieces in it and it was just, I, I'm not even sure how to fully describe it, but that always tickles me when you get those, you know, it, it, they, they arrive in the mail and you know, what's this? And, and it's amazing. Um, and so I do appreciate the effort that goes into those uh, displays and it, it takes something that could be, uh, um, you know, obligatory and makes it special. Um, so I keep those. Do you ever talk amongst yourselves about uh, accepting letters after the due date or not? Yes. Yes, you always accept them or yes, you talk about it? No, yes, we, we talk about it on this particular occasion and I'm going to I'm gonna call them out. Uh, Sir Signey and uh, Lord Thomas Kilbride tend to fight for each other. And it's not like they didn't know crowd turning was coming. And Sir, Tom, I mean, uh, Lord Thomas uh, Kilbride is, of course, Duke Christoph's squire and a member of Adelheid's household. And Duchess Signy, of course, is my significant other and a member of our household. Um, they, uh, they spaced it and didn't submit till uh, Monday. So we let them in. Um, Neuter and Ingegerd this time because, and I, and I hate this, Ingegerd injured her knee. They were gonna fight for each other. And Neuter and Ingegerd um, kind of figured out where they were and decided that yes, Neuter wanted to fight for Ingegerd, um, but she was still getting diagnostics and everything. So they submitted after the coronation weekend and, and we accepted those. So, yeah. Do you ever get uh, folks who, who, who submit letters of intent just in case and aren't sure if they're going to participate or not? Sure, yeah. That happens. Okay. And then life changes, you know, somebody's job calls them in or uh, somebody finds out their lady is pregnant and they didn't know that when they submitted the letter, that's happened. Um, anything and everything can happen between now and the first weekend in May. Okay, so next question. Um, what, and this was supposed to be for Simone, but I think probably anyone can answer, what from law and policy would you like to highlight for fighters and consorts? Adelheid, do you have anything on law and policy that you would love for new consorts and fighters to know? Um, if it's not anything particular, I would just love for them to actually read law and policy. <laughs> that would be the very, very first thing that you wanna do and never ever, ever make a decision until you've went and looked up at policy or law before you declare something. Trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, they should definitely, they should definitely take a once through corpora generally. I mean, start to finish. Then they should read section uh, four, uh, which is the section on royalty. They should read section four and they should go through all of section four. Uh, they should look at quali selection, qualifications, privileges, limitations, um, and then kingdom uh, law, uh, the crown, definition of the crown, how you uh, may award, how you may um, confer awards. And then you need to definitely look at reservations to the board, which is the board telling the Royals, we'll handle this part, all right? So you should definitely read uh, section four very closely in Corpora. And then in the most updated uh, February 2022 edition of uh, Kingdom Law, you need to read um, everything on page uh, 22, which has to do with Crown Tournament, eligibility for Crown Tournament, uh, and then go back and read all of Kingdom Law, including how the Crown interacts with the great officers of state and their reports. 
And then you should read the great book of policy and understand the distinct roles of the kingdom great officers. You should also understand that the great officers report not uh, just to the crown, but more importantly, they have corporate uh, superiors. Um, so there's a dual, there's a, there's a double track there. Um, so when you say anything in particular, it's everything, you know, read the laws. So Jocelyn and Sarah, I know you have updated um, the, the uh, Marshall's policy and rules. Are there anything that uh, should be highlighted uh, as far as changes that would be relevant, especially for Crown Tournament? Sorry to spring this on you. Oh no, it's a great question. Um, no, uh, while the rules revisions were extensive, um, there wasn't anything that, that would have a major impact on Crown or even a minor impact on Crown. Okay, that's good. Sarah, anything that you would like fighters and consorts to know from law? Um, just what His Majesty said. Okay, like everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eckhart, and, Eckhart and Jane, Any, anything else you want to highlight? I, I concur with what uh, Her Majesty said. Read, read, read. And if you're going to make a decision, review that section of policy and law so that you know what you can do, what you can't do. And so that when you talk, you can talk with some knowledge about what you're doing. Certainly, certainly something that we did every time we had to, to do something that made sure that we went and read and reviewed. Okay, uh, Eckhart, while we're on you, because um, uh, Cohen's already talked about the format for the upcoming crown tournament. What did you consider when considering the format for your crown tournament? Uh, well, Kapoor says that you have to have a double elimination tournament. And uh, to be honest, with everything that was going on in our reign, I thought simple was best. And so a standard double elimination tournament sounded just fine. It's what people know. It's what they understand. Um, and I thought that was just the best thing for our reign to keep it, keep it simple. Don't try to reinvent the wheel or do something flashy do what people know do a you know i knew we were going to be at a small small venue so um it made sense to do it that way nothing that was going to require a whole lot of fields yes jocelyn well and and his majesty and i had talked about you know using special weapons like the maces of doom or whatever in the finals or using match weapons in the finals and that kind of thing and we talked about it and we'd ultimately decided no, just because it would have had fighters using weapons that they're not familiar with, you know, and that it just adds potential complications and possibility for, you know, people not feeling like they were able to do their best. Um, so, you know, you try to, you want to keep stuff interesting with, a, with the format but you don't want stuff to be really flaky. Like um, his, their majesty's current crown, there's gonna be a bunch of opportunity for people to fight a non-standard, non-Atlantean standard weapons forums, but they're gonna be fighting with weapons they're familiar with. And so that, that gives you a little bit of insight as to how we, we try to you know, keep things interesting, but not too interesting. Well, they've got plenty of time to know what kind of uh, weapons forms to practice with in advance because of, it was announced well in advance as opposed to surprise you're in the finals here play with this mace of doom. <laughs> so Sarah, as the as the MOL, what what about the the format? You know, um, I don't. Do you have any input into the format? What kind of preparations do you need to make? Um. No, if the format is matching with society and, you know, kingdom law, I'm like, I aim to please and I will serve. So it's just a matter of making sure I have enough staff to handle the situation and I can supervise the preliminaries and then take over for the finals. 
So it's just making sure I have the paperwork that I need for the day. So uh, what kind of um, what kind of staffing do you, needs do you have for the tables? Um, in this instance, I will have two groups of MOLs um, handling the round robins. You know, they'll each take care of a list, and then we'll switch them out as the lists go on. And then I will have um, some of those MOLs will help me with the double elimination tournament at this time. So I think I have probably, I want to say six MOLs. So, so since, there's gonna be, today. since there's going to be the four round robins at the beginning. Um, right. But from what I understand, they're going to be running two of them. And then it's going to be one and then one. So it'll be two groups running those two and then one and one. Okay. So, yeah, so only, had, only two list fields at a time. Yeah, right. we had talked with the oral marshal about um, the possibility of running four fields at once. And I think I talked with Sarah about this as well. And I think what we came down with, the consensus was, let's just do two weapons forms at one time and two lists because it's a round robin. And so people need to keep track of who they fought. The MLs need to keep track of who they fought to determine the top four in each list. So let's just do two. And I don't remember what we decided if we decided whether it's going to be like great sword and sword and shield going on at the same time. And then when mm -hmm. they're finished, we'll do pole arm and dual weapon going on yep. at the same time. Uh, but we still should run that out. So you don't need eight um, MOLs, maybe just four or five. I don't need 12 or 13 MOLs like we did for the uh, one the where we had four. four. Yeah. yeah. Well, so and it's remember, a lot less fun, though. Though. It was fun, It was though. great. <laughs> but I barely, we barely had enough MOLs to cover it because there's a lot of MOLs that are also consorts. So and we were all jammed in, but, in there, jammed in and, there at Silverleaf. Yeah. And we don't yeah. want the conflict of interest. So it's right. best that we have MOLs that are... <laughs> Not contours. I know where to aim my camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that is that is something to consider when you're when you're getting your staff. You're making sure that none of your staff, both the marshal staff and both the the uh, MOL staff, um, mm -hmm. none of those are are going to be consorts or obviously fighters or um, you know mothers or fathers. Or do you consider? Extended family or just like immediate consorts, fighters? Yes. I, speaking for myself, if somebody could conceivably have a vested interest in the outcome of the fight, they shouldn't be marshalling the fight at a major tournament. So that, that makes it hard sometimes because you need senior marshals, you need marshals who can stand up to a Duke if they need to you know, and you need two marshals per list. So it's really hard to run a bunch of lists uh, once you start winnowing down that, those criteria, especially since a lot of those people that check all those other boxes are gonna be fighting in crown. Yep. And for the one that we did a few years ago for his majesty with the multiple fields going, we had three MOLs at every field to check, verify and record, so. It, it was a lot of manpower that we needed, but again, um, definitely the vested interest is um, something to consider. Yeah. Duchess Simone has very kindly joined us this time. So hello, welcome Simone. We understand you've got a lot on your plate, so that's fine. I, I apologize, I was late. I, I had to go into a, another meeting and I have a meeting at eight with the Society Seneschal again. So oh. I'll have to drop out again. Oh, okay. We will try and make it quick then. Uh, well, let's go back to the beginning for everyone else. Uh, what was your, because everyone else already answered this, what's your favorite part of Crown Tournament? My favorite part of Crown Tournament is watching the bouts. And I particularly love to be behind the MOLs so that I can be in the know, even if I'm not Kingdom Seneschal. I have, I have crashed their party more than once, as you know. Um, but I, I actually really love watching the consorts excitement on the side of the field when the bouts are going on and just the populace and how they respond to what's happening on the field. And what preparations do you have to do um, as Seneschal ahead of Crown Tournament? So we make a list 
of all of the participants that uh, have put their names in. And just as the MOL goes in and checks authorizations, I go in and confirm everyone is a member and that their membership will be good through a reign. Um, if their membership will not complete the reign, if they win, then I will notify them that they're good to fight, but they have to renew immediately if they win because corporate requires that you complete that paperwork immediately if you win so that you're good through your reign. Yes, very important. Oh, what are the required qualifications to enter that are in that are in law? Do you know off the top of your head? I probably don't know off the top of my head, but uh, you do have to be a member in good standing of the Society for Creative Anachronism, and you have to be acceptable to the crowns. The crowns oh, often have, of, I was going to say the crowns often have other criteria that they look for. Yes. So. so 7.7.1 eligibility for crown tournament. In addition to the requirements set forth in Corpora uh, 4A2 and 4B, all combatants and their consorts of the crown tournament must, and, and 4A2 and 4B includes, among other things, membership requirements, must be presented to and acceptable to the crown, willing and able to fulfill the duties of the crown, intend to make an honorable attempt to compete for the crown, be subjects of the kingdom of Atlantia for at least one year immediately prior to the crown tournament, submit a letter of intent to fight and crown to the crown by the due date set. The letter of intent shall include the following required information, modern SCA names along with addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, membership information, numbers and expiration dates, any additional information requested by the crown, have arms registered with the College of Heralds or present proof of heraldic submission through a warranted herald prior to the crown tournament. And some of these requirements uh, carry an asterisk and may be waived at the discretion of the crown, including having, uh, having uh, heraldry registered and submitting a letter of uh, intent. Uh, at, and, and pretty much that's it. Uh, I guess the residency, yeah, that's it. And I want to thank Simone because due to her hard work, because she's got a lot of irons in the fire, you know, separate and apart from moving states and trying to find her replacement, which she's done for us. Thank you. Um, she's got our list ready to publish of combatants and consorts. And um, after I speak with Ash uh, Adelheid after this meeting, we'll get that published tonight so everybody can see who's fighting. Okay. Wonderful to know. So Simone, we've already asked this of everyone else, but what of law and policy would you like to highlight to any prospective entrants and consorts? So I would recommend that any prospective entrants, entrant and consort take the time to actually read Kingdom Law and then go and read Kapora, because we we say you should know it, but until you actually have to uphold it, you, you don't know it in and out. And uh, the crowns must be intimately acquainted with law and policy and Kapora. Definitely. So since we were talking earlier about um, the format of Crown Tournament, what happens if a mistake or a change needs to be done to a, a tree? For example, um, there was an, ap an accidental fight that wasn't planned on the tree, which hasn't happened in a long time, or um, a fighter wins, but then has to drop out afterwards. What happens when there's a change to the tree as it is set? Then that, ha that change has to be approved and signed off on by all of the participants, such as the Earl Marshal, the Crowns, the MOL, and the Kingdom Seneschal. So all four of you have to sign off. Well, I always insist on signing off on things just so that I'm backing everyone up. But the seneschal is not required to sign on. But the you. seneschal is not required to sign off. Okay. Now, uh, Sarah and Jocelyn, 
if there is a change, have, would you have a conversation amongst yourselves? You know, uh, how de how detailed do you think you would have to go into that, or has it just never come up? Thankfully, knock on wood, and pray for the best. I mean, I I haven't seen anything that complicated or earth shattering that a that a list had to be, you know, re signed off on. Um, usually if people need to drop out, then you just kind of pass, count that as a loss and you just sort of pass that through. Um, I don't know, Sarah, what are, what are your thoughts there? Um, I haven't seen anything, but, um, I would be definitely including their majesties in any conversations as well. Just so everyone's on the same page, but, yeah. um, yeah, I haven't thankfully had to have a situation like that either. So. That's good. That means we're everybody's doing their job, right? Yeah. Okay. So let me. Yes, your best. There, there's a reason that we have a rule that once the tree is set and the required signatures are on it, it can't be uh, messed around with. And uh, there was a crown attorney some years ago. And um, somebody wanted to um, set up the list the way he wanted to set up the list. And he tried to change the list once it started to proceed because he wanted to choose who fought who all the way through. And had the Earl Marshal and the senior marshals present not stood up to that individual, um, it would have been a very different kind of a day. So thank goodness we haven't had to deal with that but once. And that's well, all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> well, I know in my memory, there's been at least twice where there have need, been needed to have uh, signed changes on the tree. Uh, one time where the, the fighter who won his bout uh, took an injury. And so he ended up withdrawing. And so the, the question was, does a buy go in that space or does um, the fighter who he, who lost to him go in that space? Um, so that was uh, something that um, the crown, the marshal and the OL had to all agree on. Um, what was it? Was, tell me, um, tell me. Huh? What was it? What was the decision on that? Well, the fighter in particular who withdrew asked that the person that he defeated essentially wipe that loss and be given um, his spot in the tree. And at the time, the crowns, the marshal and the, and the OL all agreed to that. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, that's what they all agreed to. Um, and then there was also a, a time when um, the planned format of the tree was uh, changed just a little bit for the finals in order to, um, because uh, the, a lot of times I know uh, the tree will be uh, set by order of precedence. And in this particular case, it wasn't. And um, the, the finals would not have been um, the top two fighters. The top two fighters would have actually met in the semifinals. And so the tree was changed in that case and um, everyone signed off on it. So it went forth. So those are two that I have witnessed just from the sidelines, not being any of the people who had to do the signing, thankfully. So, um, and if you want to call more questions about that, ask me afterwards. Um, so fighters, what kind of training regimen do you engage in leading up to crown that might differ from your normal or regular training that you engage in. And Eckhart went into great detail about watching all the fights of all the people he anticipated and be against. And that was clearly not your normal training regimen before crown tournament, but you went into it the last one prepared. I wanted to win. You wanted to win. So, but you're not saying the previous times you didn't want to win. I didn't want to win, but I really wanted to win. I, I, Going in this this the time that I won, I, I've always wanted to win. I would always fought the best that I could, but I wanted there to be nothing that I could have looked back and said, "Well, I could have done more." This time, I wanted to win, and uh, and and 
the, my competitors were going to have to prove to me that I was not the winner because I did the work and they were going to have to prove it to me. Makes sense. Your Majesty? He also knew a few months ahead of time that everyone would be required to wear masks. So even though there before the date was set for crown, he still trained with the mask so that. Um, yeah, that was that was a whole other level of thing, because, yeah, once before masks were ever even a thing, I was training in a mask. Yeah, that was just. Just so we know, there's no mask required for the upcoming round tournament. Yeah, that's right. But <laughs> right. fighting in a mask is a lot different than fighting without one, especially in, we'll take the finals that uh, with me and Havor. We had very long, prolonged fights um, of just going out there and sitting in a uh, very tense state. And, and, and for my part, that was very purposeful. I wanted Havorth breathing heavy before I ever made an attack that would expose me to danger. Um, because I, I knew that I had done all of the aerobic training that I could. I didn't know what he had done, but I knew what I had done. And I knew I could last for some time out there. Um, also, there's a, there's a fine line that you play with fighting in a mask. Um, in, in your recovery, um, you can exert yourself to a certain point and it takes a set amount of time to recover. There's a line that if you cross it, you will not recover. You will fight in a deficit. And if you cross that, you're you have to win now because you're only going to get slower and you're only going to get more uh, um, asphyxiated. So those you have to know that fighting in a mask. And you have to be hyper aware of it, especially in a tournament that really counts. Your Majesty, what did you go through in preparation for this outcome, for the crown, the tournament that you won? Well, we had taken masks off shortly, you know, during the summer when we thought we were, thought we were getting somewhere and we had taken masks off for fighting and then I had, I ended up wearing three different masks during that crown. I'm gonna tell you what, I will, I, I will probably forego any more mask fighting, whatever. And we're gonna keep reviewing the situation month by month. But I think if it comes to fighting in a mask, I may have to forego that. Um, I wound up with the mask over my eyes a couple of times and it just, I did not, enjoy that and coming out of the pandemic especially we had not been fighting together around the kingdom and i think that led to some issues um in terms of expectations among the fighters and i'm i take my share of responsibility for that um but you know when i was when i was young um i mean i fought three four days a week and I put in the time and the miles and drove to DC to go to fight practices and took days off work and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's amazing now when Eckhart said watching video, we used to have to watch these, you know, we were blessed if there was a video camera out there and there were videos that we could watch. And now it's an essential part of everybody's training. Um, so not only during the pandemic were there a lot of classes online, instructional videos online there's huge libraries online of people fighting um and so that's that's amazing um i just tried to to get my local practices in this time um and um yeah uh, that's what i tried to do and then i just tried to be smart and you know Adelheid had to jerk a knot me a couple times but i just needed to be smart so we did get one uh, question, which is kind of going to be a little out of um, sync, but um, because I know Simone has to leave, um, we did get a question from um, the event steward for the upcoming crown tournament about if there was anything else that he needed to do in order to help any of the officers or the crown. But um, Simone, in general, you know, what can the event steward 
for Crown Tournament do in order to assist the officers, assist the Crown um, in, in order to make it um, the most successful day possible from the autocrats point of view? Well, from my perspective as a former autocrat and working with the Kingdom Event Bid Committee and Sarah could speak to this, Sarah, who is our Event Bid Committee, um, who's here as a consort, but also, um, I would say that this is the easiest event in many ways for the kingdom to put on because so many of the officers have specific roles that they take part in. So the most important thing for the event steward is to provide space and uh, adequate space and to have someone excellent in charge of setting up the field that works with the Earl Marshal to make sure, or the marshal in charge, to make sure that the field is set up and that there is adequate space around the field for combatants and the consorts, as well as the crown and the MOL. And those are vitally important. You know, feasts are lovely and important parts of our society, but when it comes to crown tourney, everyone's there to see the, the tourney and people wanna have space to be able to participate in their own way at the tournament. So for the event steward, they need to provide space and to have good people there to make sure parking happens, to make sure that people can get in and get out to set up. That was certainly amazing to watch at the, the fall crown. The Dunkerry did a great job of lining people in, dropping things off and getting back out of the way so people could get in and, and set up. Those are very important parts. Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? What the autocrat can do to help? No, I think you covered everything really well. Just, you know, communication with the crowns is key. Making sure they have what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Baroness Sarah, event committee head right now. So your majesties, do you have anything that you need from an, from an autocrat? above and beyond what you normally get from an autocrat? No, and, and I think um, well, we've been very fortunate in our Crown autocrats, and this time's no exception from the autocrats, the field coordinator. They have done a great job. They've set up some uh, Zoom meetings to talk about uh, the site and uses for the site, places for us to uh, meet with people, We've given them feedback. When I was up at Bloodbath this weekend, I talked to the autocrat about, uh, and to their excellencies during a Zoom meeting last Thursday, Her Majesty and I talked about, we're not gonna have a great court in the beginning uh, because the list field's gonna be set up. We're gonna have procession, get things rolling uh, and try and move through that process fairly quickly. Um, but then once things are broken down towards the end of the day, and hopefully everybody will jump in and pitch in, stack, tourney rail, all that kind of stuff, then we'll have room to have a great court. Um, so we talk about site limitations and things like that. And I want to echo what was said about uh, uh, Crown Tourney in, um, in November. What a, it's a beautiful, a beautiful place and neat to learn. It used to be an actual port and the, the water came right up behind there and I just, I geek out on that kind of stuff, but the way they got everybody in and out, checked status uh, and, and moved everybody around the site, got the tent set up, got all the vehicles to the appropriate place, held that whole tournament and broke it all down by dinner time. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Caridon's team did a heck of a job. That's for sure. A, a lot of people don't know that that site and Caridon and all that really, happened in very, very short notice. Um, we, we did not have a, a crown tourney site uh, when we stepped up. And uh, so uh, we made a lot of decisions, not quite the 11th hour, but far closer to the crown tournament than I really would have, <laughs> would have liked. Um, it was a little stressful, a little stressful. But they did amazing. Like everybody said, they uh, the the site was was beautiful, historic. Um, 
we didn't we didn't tear up the ground too bad back there, which was nice. And it was a, it was a wonderful day. All right, before we end some stuff, um, I have a question for the consorts. So for your Majesty Adelheid and your Excellency Jane, what, how do you keep from getting extremely stressed out by the end of the day? Um, I'm lucky in that I have a very uh, solid and strong household. So I have individuals who are around me that really make the day go easier for me. They make sure that I don't have to ask for anything. They take care of the field setup. They take care of any food, make sure I have something to drink. Um, that way, my focus can be on my consort as needed. And, um, you know, I don't have to worry about it. I also will admit if it's available and I can have a drink at the site, I will have a drink at the site. <laughs> But short Reasonable. of that, it's, it's just the household. I mean, it's it's the people. They make it easiest for me. And um, without them, uh, I would probably be very uh, stressed out, look like a little rat running around the whole time, I imagine. Well, has it been stressful in the past? Is it generally a stressful thing, being a consort? For me, it is uh, 100%. Um, I feel like I'm in the fight with them most of the time. So you'll often see me out next to the field hiding behind somebody jabbing along with them or moving my head around or um, at times also making commentary like maybe we shouldn't be uh, doing this anymore or you know like uh, let's make sure we're clean you know stuff like that so it's always sort of stressful because you want your fighter to look their best and they rely on at least mine have always relied on me to tell them when things don't look good or, you know, if, if something's going awry, I'm sort of their second set of eyes and to be the reasonable one, because when they're out there fighting, sometimes I think they um, don't always see the adrenaline is pumping, right? So I'm the second set of eyes. So Jane, how do you keep from getting stressed out or do you get stressed out? <laughs> um, yeah, um, it, it's always a little stressful. Um, we started fighting in Crown nine years ago. Um, our son Isaac was only, I think, three months old at the time. Um, it's steadily gotten better, you know, as the years have gone on and he's gotten older and, and the oldest has been able to help with things. Um, I think it's gotten, um, I think this past time, I, I, it was stressful, but in a different sort of way because you had you had it in the back of your mind. Oh my gosh, this could actually happen. So, you know, when you have that mindset, you kind of have some things going on in your head about the, about everything. And he's always told me. He said it's just another day until they offer you a chair at the side of the field. <laughs> you know? Um, it's true. It's true. It, it is true. But any consort, the day of crown, any consort has the potential of being the next prince or princess. Um, so um, it's something that you really do have to wrap your head around because it could be anybody's day. Um, and I have to say that this past time, um, when, when he was getting near the finals, I have to say a big thank you to Her Majesty because she was right there behind me and I don't know what I would have done without her right there because it all happened really fast. And when it happened, I kind of went, oh. <laughs> you know, I did this deep breath out. She took the circlet off the back of my head and went out with him. And I mean, she was with me the rest of the afternoon. So um, thank God for people like her, who is not only a friend, but who has done it before. So she knew exactly what to do. Whereas, you know, me, you know, even though we've done this, you've been behind the crown before, but never actually in the hot seat. So um you know, having someone there that could be your person. And that was, <laughs> it's good to have a person. <laughs> Necessary to have people. Support is always a good thing. Yeah. 
So it is now eight o'clock. So I know if any of you guys need to leave, we completely understand. But um, I do have at least one more question um, for everyone is uh, what can the populace do to enhance Crown Tournament experience? So MOL, what can the populace do to make Crown Tournament better? Um, enjoy the day, enjoy the pageantry, and um, be aware of the safety zones for the fighters around the list field and for the MOLs. But um, really, it's just enjoy the day, enjoy the pageantry. Jocelyn? So I'm going to say something that, you know, maybe a lot of people will object to, but um, for me, it really pulls me, and I think it pulls other people out of the day too, when there's a ton of people with iPhones and cameras hard close to the list field, taking a bunch of pictures and taking a bunch of video. It really is, it can pull people out of the moment. And I would, I would say to the populace, you know, focus on being there and experiencing it yourself rather than trying to capture it for immortality because when you do stuff like that, you, you miss it. It's like, you know, going to the Grand Canyon and spending so much time taking pictures that you miss the, the really cool stuff that's on, that's by the trail. Well, and we've got some amazing photographers who put a lot of work into capturing great pictures from Crown Tournament, yeah. but you know, me and my iPhone, what are we, what are we going to do that, that they can't do, right? And, and they've got the kinds of lenses and stuff where they can kind of be unobtrusive and, you know, still get great shots without being this blatantly modern thing that that's right there. You know, and I, I talked to my marshals about, you know, try not to wear sunglasses, try to have a really nice period appearance in the field. And I'd encourage people who are going to be standing around the field to sort of you know, kind of think about about that themselves. Good to think about. Simone, are you still here? Do you have any uh, advice on what the populace can do to enhance Crown Tournament? You know, I, I absolutely agree with what Jocelyn just said. Uh, not because not being in the moment, you do, um, you're separated slightly if you've got that camera up. And uh, I, I think that taking part and participating in watching the bouts, in watching people's faces around the tournament field and, and just being there. Now, I also love pageantry. So I love it when I see all of the decor that people put up in their tents, whether it's wall, whether it's hangings or banners, whatever it is. And I, I love to see that color and pageantry come out, not just with the combatants and the consorts, but everyone who's there for the day. So, you know, making our heraldic display shine, whether you are part of the tournament or not, I think is, is very important. It, it pulls you into that moment and makes you part of it. Eckhart and Jane, what do you think the populace can do in order to enhance Crown Tournament as an event? That hasn't already been said. That hasn't already been said. At this point in time, since we're all back together, and just enjoy being together. Um, it's it's a great day, full of the pageantry and um, just being able to be together and support people, um, no matter who ends up with the hat on their head. I mean, we're all just regular people that have a shiny hat. So um, just enjoy it and don't be afraid to talk to people. New people. New people, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a real big fan of pennants flying in the air. I think pop, when the populace uh, brings their personal pennants, their uh, local groups pennants and puts those up flying at the, at the day shade they're under or close by, or I've seen it one time when they were attached to the list fence. That was amazing day. Um, 
So I, I think penance is the, is the way. I mean, it, it adds so much to a crown attorney to me. Um, Heraldic display as to the pageantry. Foo-foo. 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 All right, your majesties, we'll give you the last word. Come on, Edelheit, what do you think that a general populace can do to enhance crown tournament? Looks like he's pointing to you. Her I'm, ac I'm actually going to spin it around and, and ask the question to the populace instead, because I don't think that that's a question for us to answer. More so, it is to say, what can we as crowns do for the populace to make crown tournament more enjoyable? What can we do to make court better? What can we do to make the event exciting or uh, give you a reason to want to be there. So not to take it out of your hands there, jean vive but I feel like that's a, a question that we should ask and get, get a response to. I think it's important. So any populist members who have that answer, how should they get that to you? I think it would be interesting if there was some way for the MOLs or somebody to announce who's fighting. To, to give us some idea, not just at the finals, but along the way, let us know who's fighting. Okay, that's the uh, disembodied voice of Baroness Cassare. Yes, um, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. I've got um, a new PC that I'll set up for me mm -hmm. and not everything is, <laughs> I had to download Zoom and everything. <laughs> not everything's set up. And that's something that Heralds should be doing to a certain extent on the field. Uh, depending on how their majesties want everything to be called that day. Yeah, because there's also the heraldry. Yeah, but if you don't know the heraldry of somebody, you can't figure out who's fighting. Well, the heralds are supposed to be at some, I know for the um, major tournament we did for uh, His Majesty a few years ago, heralds were calling who won, who was fighting who before every tournament during the round robin in every field. So there are some heralds that are actually doing some of that work out there. And it's not well, just the shields. Something that we as the populace can do is when their majesties and, and, and Duchess Simone do publish the list of who's fighting, we can just go to the OP and check out and see whose arms are what, right? right. Well, there was one year somebody did like a um, crown cheat sheet Yes, there was a Lord Kristoff, and I can't remember his SCA last name, but he did yeah, a couple of years where he did yeah. great laminated crown tournament entries and the arms of all of the fighters and the yeah. consorts. And it was a heroic effort, but and yeah. it was a lot of effort. But yes, those were pretty neat when he did that. It's true. Cohen, do you have anything else to say? Last words? Yeah, <laughs> of course I do. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for asking the populace what we want. I think uh, your majesties and your excellencies, I think you both do at, in your past reigns and the most recent reign, and I look forward to it in the current reign. Um, you do a great job of encouraging pageantry, but not requiring it so that people of any ability level, experience level, and income level can feel like they're participating in the dream. Um, I find, have found courts, both in the reign that just ended and in your current reign that's just begun, I find your courts very engaging for people who are playing at all levels, not just people playing at a high level. Um, and I think that seeing that at the crown tourney helps set the tone for a reign, um, especially if people weren't able to make coronation. Um, and I always love to see that, to be able to tell from a crown tourney, you know, what kind of reign we're going to have. and. Um, I did note that the, um, the autocrat for their crown tourney has put out a call for many field heralds to make sure that people can hear what's going on and be part of the process. And I think that that's an important part of us kind of continuing the recovery from the pandemic. So thank you very much for encouraging that involvement by everyone at every level. And thank you for participating in this round table because I think that's an important part of the whole process. And we appreciate you making time on a Tuesday night to speak with all of us with all of these different questions. Did anyone else have any other questions uh, before we wrap this up? I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording just in case people would prefer to ask their questions off recording.